So we're having our last talk for today at the Wintergarten stage. There will be, why is there no new release? Nobody pays for the basics. Shlomo Shapiro and Gracian Dese. Hi. Okay. Uh, quick question to start. Who actually runs their own open source project here? Okay. Who has more than one? Nice. Uh, the topic we want to talk about today is something everybody should have, which is backups. Do you have a backup? Hope so? No? Anyway, this is not about backups. This is about a tool that automates backup recovery, and we want to tell the story how we got here and what you can learn from us in terms of running an open source project, and we have actually the hope that you will help us to run our open source project better. Okay. This is my slide. So I'm Gracia. This is my friend Shlomo. Um, what can I say about myself? I'm an independent uh, consultant since uh, 96 last century. So quite some lo long time already. Uh, did a lot, a lot of consultancy, of course, because it's my main job uh, for a lot of companies like uh, Swift, uh, HP, um, Mercedes-Benz, uh, Johnson & Johnson. Um, but I also did a lot of open source stuff already in the beginning when I was an employee. I uh, started at the university. I was lucky to work with supercomputers there, so that was a nice stuff to start with. Afterwards, I was uh, at Alcatel, and there I introduced, in fact, the open source for the first time. Uh, I was responsible for the Unix stuff over there, and I started with BitNet and stuff like that. It's very old, ancient. Uh, a lot of people may be still aware about BitNet. First, before internet. No? Okay, very nice. <laughs> but okay, anyhow. Um, and in that way, I started to, to, to get involved in the Unix community. Uh, I'm from Belgium, so it was the Belgian Unix Users Group. And I became responsible to prepare software on a CD-ROM, because there was the before the internet time. Uh, so I did a lot of collections. Um, I got sponsored by Sun Microsystems with uh, their computers. So I got some computers. I could collect software, and I prepared CD-ROMs. And this is a picture of a few of them. And uh, the most famous, I think, or the best one, in my opinion, was the Linux 95. That came out before the Windows 95. <laughs> there were really operating systems on it. Slackware, for example, or the Debian were already on there. And I did a lot of collections. And once I had an uh, agreement with the uh, Museum of Paris, the Louvre, you know that? A lot of paintings. They had an, a website. I got permissions to really put the complete Louvre on the CD-ROM. It's one of these. I think it was that, that, that one there on the left in 94. It was a quite achievement. So it was a complete website collected on the internet and put on the CD-ROM, and it worked perfectly. So I got all the links working. It was, I think, 10,000, 25,000 links. I don't know anymore. Uh, are automated with scripting and, uh, and kind of Linton, stuff like that. Okay, that was the open source uh, stuff I did before. And then my first really open source project was Make CD-ROM Recovery. Why? Because in 99, uh, I was working for HPE then as a consultant, and they had a great software for HPX called Ignite. Kind of disaster recovery, and you could also um, Right, like uh, kickstart operating systems with it, right, HPX10. And I asked the lab there, because I get interaction with the lab and for HP, and I asked them, can't you do that for Linux? No, we are not interested in Linux, they said. And then I said, yeah, I want disaster recovery for Linux. So I started writing it. I was working for a um, bank association via HP then, and uh, it's a bank in Belgium. And I had some time, so I started working on that. And make say the ROM recovery was a quite a success in the beginning, and that's why, at that moment, I uh, uh, got together with Sloma because uh, he used to also make say the ROM recovery. I think in Germany they called it uh, make drag or something. 
I didn't understand it well, but drag is another word uh, for something dirty. <laughs> Okay, so that was the predecessor of Relax and Recover. Relax and Recover was, in fact, uh, wrote together with Shlomo in the beginning. I'll come back to that later. Okay, that's about the open source. So I have a lot of other open source projects also. Uh, there's a, also a bigger one that I'm still using, and quite some companies use. Um, well, okay, but that's not that important. You can find everything of my open source projects on my website, itt.be, there's a blog. And I have github.com, and you can find my, my there also all the open source projects. And my daily activities, yeah, I'm a Linux engineer, so I do have, uh, a lot of Linux engineering. I do a lot of um, prepare patch bundles, for example, um, for big companies. I do a lot of Kubernetes management, I think 12 of them. And um, source code management with Ceph, I do it for a company for Johnson & Johnson, it's more than 14,000 compu uh, so computers that I'm responsible for, for part of the source that is distributed. Relax and Recover is also distributed by chef and automated uh, installations and prepared. It's completely automated. And I also use chef Python, uh, best scripting, of course. And then the last couple of months, I write a lot of C programs. But that's another story. It's up to you now. Yeah. So a few words about me. Uh, 25 years of Linux and open source experience from the last century, actually. Good point. Um, I did write more projects, most of them actually doing something with backup and restore. Currently, my focus is IT strategy, IT governance, automating whatever we can. I'm working at a consultancy here in Berlin. You can find more about me on my blog. And quick word, Tactit Consulting, we are not consultants, we're everything else. We are also inconvenient if we believe you need to hear that. If you want to know more, look up our homepage, talk to me, happy to help you. Let's talk about Rear, the open source project. It's a Linux bare metal restore or Linux disaster recovery solution. Depending from which country you come, you would use one or the other term. We have seven maintainers and actually 193 contributors in our Git, the project exists for quite a long time, and it's active and successful. Because my interaction with the project is mostly somebody calling me up and saying, hey Shlomo, we're using Relax and Recover for 10 years, and we're super happy. Now our company is changing the backup tool, and we need your help. So what is actually we're doing? Rear as an idea, complements an existing backup tool with bare metal disaster recovery. So if you're a bigger organization, if you have a data center, you typically have all your servers covered by a backup tool. And when you need to recover a server from an outage, you typically are supposed to do that manually. And we automate the process. And Relax and Recover integrates with a lot of commercial backup tools to facilitate automated bare metal restore. Even if you have 1,000 servers or more, no problem, it's a push of a button. What's the business value for users? And, and that's actually how most rear projects kind of start. I think there's a feedback from that somehow. Um, commercial disaster recovery tools cost 100K, 300K, whatever. Users using Relax and Recover typically pay something like 20k for an introductory project if they need a project whatsoever. I mean, it's open source, so people just use it, and that's it. And what happens for this money is integrating another backup tool into the open source project, which means reverse engineering how they, do, how they work and implementing that. That's what I've been doing for the last 20 years, most of the time. We have a very wide ecosystem integration. Uh, Red Hat and SUSE list Relax and Recover as the default recommended way for disaster recovery. There is a server component called DRLM, another open source project, and one backup vendor, SEP CSAM, actually decided to not develop their own bare metal restore tool, but instead integrate Relax and Recover and just recommend using that. A bit more about how we got there. Okay, oh yeah, thank you. Um, some history about Rear. Yeah. 
So, like I said in the introduction talk of myself, uh, it started with Make CDROM Recovery, which was a disaster recovery software for Linux only. The purpose was to put it on a CD-ROM or a DVD, huh? over an ISO image, that was also possible. But okay, it has its limitations. It was in fact one big script, and I used Make around it to a lot of stupid things. Uh, but it was an interesting project. It was more an engineering project at that time. But okay, it started to grow. It became more or less popular because there were a lot of downloads, and it had a lot of limitations because it was one big script, in fact, and that was not that good. And that's why Shlomo came in, because he had another project, I think it was OpenVPN or something? Uh, OpenVPN Builder. OpenVPN Builder. It was a kind of a framework, and he said to me, yeah, I like your tool, I'll use your tool, but why don't we rewrite it using my framework, and you have the knowledge how to make and disaster recovery from Linux from the start, from scratch, in fact. And I, I liked the idea, and so that was in 2006. I think I wrote it, uh, well, the framework was from Slomo, that was not too, was already there, of course, but I wrote it in a couple of months. I think two months later, the first release came out of Rear. In 2006, it was an immediately success. Uh, we were astonished, we said, okay, what, what, what happening? Uh, it was only tar, uh, so it was only tar backup effect that we had at that moment. And yeah, it was an ISO image, and uh, it later more stuff came in, pixie booting came, came in, and stuff like that. All, uh, it it grew uh, quite a lot. Um, but actually, at that point, in between 2006 and 2010, I got contacted by SUSE, and I did a lot of uh, consultancy jobs for rear for bigger companies like Mercedes-Benz integrates with Tivoli Manager, for example, I did there. For Johnson & Johnson, I did a net backup uh, integration together with Rear, and some other st stuff like that. And in 2010, uh, Susie decided to put Rear in their high availability portfolio. So not in the mainstream, but if you have a high availability contract with them, Rear was also in there. A couple of years later, uh, we had uh, some good contributors at that moment, uh, Doug and uh, I forgot his other name, um, that wrote for the Belgian police uh, a lot of uh, more components, USB for example, and a lot of stuff for that, for the Belgian police. So it came, be became popular in that sense that also Red Hat was interested, and in 2015, uh, well, before that, I was almost two years that I had a Fedora project with Rear, was already in the enterprise software level edition. I had to do a lot of things be to become a Fedora ambassador uh, before I was allowed to make packages for, uh, for Epil and for Red Hat. And that took it over, in fact, that they said, okay, we put it in the main base of Red Hat OS in the RHEL, and in 2015, and that point, Real started off in the enterprises, really big. And yeah, unfortunately for us, oh yeah, maybe one thing to say, in 2006 we started Real, two years later now, uh, it will be 20 years, we have a celebration, uh, we are not sure how to do it, but we will do something. Karaoke. Uh, yeah, maybe, yeah. <laughs> But okay, we have still a couple of years to think about it. Huh? So okay, um, <coughs> what I wanted to say, what is actually going well with Rear, uh, we have an, uh, everything is on GitHub, in fact, and the user support there, all the issues, is in there. I think we have more than two thousand, up to three thousand, two and a half thousand, two and a half thousand uh, tickets already. Well, most are closed, of course. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, that means that uh, we are very proud that the uh, end users are founding, finding Rear uh, useful and they use uh, the issues to, uh, well, to, to, to make uh, requests, to find bugs and report on it, uh, user support is on there. So that is going quite well, we are quite proud of it, but uh, actually uh, in the beginning we were only with two and some others. It was not easy to fulfill all the requests from the end users. And we were luckily that uh, Suze 
And Red Hat has uh, some good contributors in that sense that they help us with the end user support. And that is going quite well the last couple of years, I would say. Uh, I think Shlomo and myself are not doing uh, daily anymore on rear stuff, which is good. That means it's mature. But uh, the end users are submitting pieces of software or requests or pull requests. And we only have to, uh, well, to, to, uh, to look at the software that they write and to make uh, a little changes over there and ask them to make some changes. And a lot of commits are done by end users. Uh, like the previous talk said, uh, we asked them, it's good to, to submit it over the next 24 hours. And then we say, yes, OK. And the interaction with the Linux distributions, like SUSE Red, is going well, uh, because they're, and they're not taking it over, of course, but uh, they're doing a lot of uh, hands work, if speaking. And that's good for us, because that means that there is, for the end users, it's good for them, because, for example, with Red Hat, Rear is a part of their distribution. They pay subscriptions, the customers. So for me, it's evident that Red Hat takes the first call. Uh, when there is a problem with Rear, they take the first call. It's submitted with them. And then the people over there are making uh, issues with us. And they make the code updates if needed. And that's happening. And it's quite good. So the code cleanup and big fixes are coming from end users, but also from SUSE and Red Hat. So the master tree is quite uh, stable and up to date. And in that sense, the code is mature. I would say the code is mature since 2015. When Red Hat uh, decided to take it over, it was mature already. Of course, new integrations came up. And that is not always easy to keep them synchronized with updates of uh, commercial backup software. Uh, that's not our main purpose anyhow. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to say, if new releases are coming, we have to take out older stuff. So uh, like Pass 3, for example, will go out in the next release. What doesn't go well, well, it's typical on open source, is documentation, I would say. Uh, it can be better. Um, I tried to start a rear user guide a couple of years ago. And I asked them to contribute a little bit so I could spend some time, because I'm an independent consultant. Uh, if I do it, everything for free, I'm already doing 20, more than 20 years open source. Uh, what I do for free, I can't earn. Huh? It's not my main purpose, but I said, okay, but it was not that a big success. Um, SUSE and Red Hat have their own uh, documentation, so that's a bit of a problem. Another thing that is a problem is the capacity. And there are not enough people to uh, fulfill all the end users' requests. So some end users' requests are coming in are dying, unfortunately, because we can't do everything. Uh, not everybody is capable to make software updates, make pull requests. And yeah, if it's not, if the mainstream, like Red Hat and Susan, don't think it's not interesting for them, it could die. Uh, sometimes it helps if they ask us to do some consultancy and add it on a payroll, but okay. And another thing is cross architecture support and testing is not always easy because we don't have all the hardware needed to test everything. And automated testing of new releases was, yeah, it's, it's, it's the same as with the cross architectures, not easy. And in that sense, I did make an open source project called Rear Automated Testing. And it was uh, together with Barrios Effect that asked me to do it, and that's where we're sponsoring it. So it's a sponsored project. And luckily, or yeah, unfortunately, there's not enough sponsor to keep it alive. So it's not that project, but it's not really alive either, and that's a pity. Um, Red Hat is there doing their own rear integration testing, but it's a very basics one. Um, it's also open source, but yeah, it's only Red Hat is using it, and SUSE is doing manual testing internally. It's short now, I think. What are the issues that we face as maintainers? And that's kind of the hard stuff that nobody wants to pay for, but everybody expects to find. Uh, obviously, engagement. So we have now seven maintainers, but not all of them are equally active. And not all of them actually are being paid for working on Relax and Recover. 
So I think there's a direct correlation. If you don't pay people for something, then you can't expect them to do, to work on that. For example, I mostly work on rear if I have a consultancy engagement where somebody asks me to go and implement something, fix something, or help them in any other way, then I, of course, use that time to also work on the project and on other topics. And, and I think that's something that all of you who maintain open source projects probably face on a daily basis, unless it's part of your day job. For me, it's not a day job. Uh, sponsoring is a big problem, and I think the kind of lack of publicity and the lack of, so to say, media work that we do directly pays into the lack of sponsoring. So people find us, we don't find users. Uh, users reach out to us not when they install the software, but actually when they have a problem. And that happens sometimes decades later, which is good for the software. It's, I mean, I take it as a compliment that somebody can use it for 10 years and didn't need to ask me. But from a commercial perspective, it's a bit unfortunate. And nobody wants to pay for regular maintenance. That's just how it is. And from the HA subscription, Suzy or Red Hat, we don't get any money back to, into the project. The only thing we get is people on Suzy and Red Hat payroll actually working on Relax and Recover as needed, which is super valuable, by the way. Like our most active maintainer, Johannes, he works for Suzy and he's doing a great job and he really takes care of a lot of these small stuff coming in every day. So without that, the project would be at a much, much worse state. And we don't have release management. So our average at the moment is, I would say, a release every couple of years, which is not cool for users, because users want to install a latest version. But we're not getting paid to make versions, so nobody makes versions. So you see kind of the evil circle. Uh, I Last year, or maybe two years ago, I set up GitHub Actions to automatically build snapshots into release packages, meaning now on GitHub, you can go to releases and find the latest snapshot and download that and use it. And I'm actually telling everybody, hey, just take that, vet it yourself in your own environment. If it works, just use it. So we kind of rolling release now. What are we trying to do about it? Um, find sponsoring, biggest challenge. Um, I'm now back in consulting after a 15-year break. Maybe that will go better. We'll see how it works. Um, we try to team up with uh, other vendors. This is Barrios, right? The, yes, that's uh, Mike um, Assen Assendorf. Assendorf, yeah. Assendorf, yeah. So we try teaming up with others. Uh, currently, we're talking with the DRLM project about maybe joining forces, merging something, whatever. We actually don't know what else to do. That's why we're here. And the question is, what would you suggest? Do you have any good advice for us, what else we can do, given the kind of context and circumstances that we are in, um, that we can maybe do different? And, and I'm happy that we have another seven minutes, at least, for that discussion. Uh, I'll be here today, tomorrow morning, uh, to come and talk to me. Tomorrow I won't have this t-shirt, because I have only one. Uh, but I'm sure you'll find me. So, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your talk. I was just sneaking around to find some questions and raised arms from the audience. Okay, I didn't have any on my web form. Yeah, it, okay. It's an honest question. What can <laughs> we do better? What would you suggest? Um, Um, it, I suppose it depends on nationality and country of banking, but have you looked at Open Collective or Tidelift or um, Pay the Devs? There are a number of funding organizations that will help do this, besides, of course, just having a button on your GitHub, the GitHub Sponsors page. Um, have you done those kinds of things? And if so, was there any success or it just wasn't worth it, the effort to put it up? Um, that's the one. And the other is, of course, making it really friendly and obvious that you're looking for this along with the obvious software stuff, um, which is probably not much help, but that's the place to start, um, which we're all stuck in, I think. Um, have you experienced using those uh, crowdfunding solutions? 
I mean, read plenty of. I, I've, I've certainly read plenty of other maintainers who write the blog posts who, you know, are frustrated just like you are, or people who've written the blog post saying, "Yes, I've done this," and Ed buys me a coffee every week, <laughs> or the few people who've done yeah. that with consulting, and then yes, I'm making a good living. But that's not that many, and it's it's a lot of other pieces to put together in terms of like the business model too. Yeah. So that's a lot more work than just what you have here, I think. So, um, fun fact, Rio was developed as a consultancy project, and I used open source as a way to give legal compliance to me delivering code to the customer without going full in with, you know, like product uh, liability. And that's worked out well ever since. And I'm not even using Rio on a daily basis because I don't do disaster recovery on a daily basis. And I imagine most people don't, so it's a bit of an insurance. It mostly applies to, you know, like large enterprises, data center operators, and whatnot. And I mean, I paid a coffee for the author of my screenshot tool because I use it every day and I find it super useful. So I'm all in for this, like, buy me a coffee. But I don't know how this works for a server software acting as an insurance, which you hopefully install and never see again. So, but uh, I think it's a good idea to look for the sponsorship pages and maybe distribute the money like for work being done. Yeah, cool. There was another question yeah, in the back. One more question here. Oh, it's not a question. It's another maybe helpful suggestion. Is that okay? Yes, please. Okay. Um, two things that might, I guess, help from learning uh, myself. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Dwayne O'Brien, who used to lead the open source program office at Indeed. I think he's somewhere else now. But he started a contributor fund at Indeed that the employees decided what open source pro projects or people that fund should go to. And I think that he has tried to uh, help other organizations use that framework because it was quite successful at Indeed, but I think a little less successful at John Hopkins University. Um, but it's interesting. If you find his GitHub, it's worth looking at as a framework to kind of suggest to companies or organizations with OSPOs, this is a way you could fund us. And then alternatively, the Google Open Source Program Office people told me once that we're not going to give you money to your project unless you have like clearly on your GitHub, like your roadmap, like what do you actually want to do? <laughs> like, what do you want us to fund? So that kind of gave me like the kick in the butt to <laughs> start like trying to announce like, okay, we want to f do these projects, these parts of the projects more clearly and not just in issues, if you know what I mean, like more clearly in a kind of roadmap way. Well, thank you for the suggestion. Uh, I, one thing I can say about, um, well, we are very lucky, or lucky that we have Suze and Red Hat helping us. But it is a curse and a blessing. It's a blessing for us that they do a lot of handwork for us and user support. But it's a curse. We are caught a bit, bit by them, by sponsoring. Yeah, if you ask for sponsoring, they say no. They just say no. I can even tell you stories, but uh, I don't want to do that. There was another big company that asked me to do, um, I just said IBM, integration with disaster recovery of Linux for IBM. They wanted me to do it for free. I said, come on, guys, I can write you a statement of work, what I need. Um, they could give me a computer uh, on a loan uh, uh, to do it. I said, no, sorry, but it takes me weeks to do it and the testing I just refused it. Uh, it took two years later, I think it was uh, IBM Japan, Japan that, uh, that did the first integration then. And afterwards, it's uh, the guy from France that did, uh, who is still a contributor, well, not anymore, or very little, but he did the, the main branches of PPC and uh, other stuff. Uh, so if you force them to work with you, they do it, but they try to misuse you. Yeah? Because a lot of, the bigger the company is, Open source should be free, and what you do should be free also, and I think that's not true. And they try to misuse you sometimes. Something to say. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you for, for your uh, showing the current situation. It came into my mind that actually the, 
the moment when your users are in contact with you, like when they, what you said, when they install the software, then it's like a normal, a happy moment for them. And I think you should try to establish a relationship, a long-lasting relationship with them, that instead of they're just downloading the software, they really should get in contact with you as the team behind, maybe by subscribing to some news feed or something like that. Because this gives you the possibility on a long-running uh, relationship, and I'm using Rear since ages, um, but I don't know about the project. I don't know what are you doing. It's not interesting for me as long I don't need to use it. But creating such a moment and then maybe sending me every year a report of, hey, this is what we did last year, and by the way, this is what we need, to that you can still relax and get sure that once your system is crashing, then you will have a happy time because you know there is the solution to it. So I think you should focus on this, what you already said, was getting, getting close to the user when they are using it. Thank you. That's actually a really good idea. Um, our time's up, so I would like to say again, thank you very much for being here, for listening to our story, giving us ideas, what we can try, and the feedback. Um, this is super useful, and I would like to encourage all of you to also uh, have an open source project and contribute to the greater good of this world. Yeah, thanks a lot for your talk. <laughs>